Good morning and welcome to the special edition North Dakota Department of Commerce Business Brief hosted by the Greater North Dakota Chamber. I'm Eric Spencer, President and CEO of the Greater North Dakota Chamber. Today we are pleased to feature Neil Kashkari, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Also joining us is Mark Wright, Senior Vice President and Research Director at the Minneapolis Fed. They'll be discussing the economic impact of COVID-19 nationally and right here in North Dakota, as well as what the future may hold. After Neil's opening remarks, Michelle Comer, North Dakota's Commerce Commissioner, will be hosting a question and answer session to get further insights and information using the questions you submitted during registration. Now, Neil became President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis on January 1st, 2016, and serves as a voting member on the Federal Open Market Committee, bringing the ninth federal district's perspective to monetary policy discussions in Washington, D.C. In addition, Neil oversees Minneapolis Fed operations and leads its many initiatives. Among them, he was instrumental in establishing the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute, whose mission is to ensure that world-class research helps to improve the economic well-being of all Americans. Most recently, he has joined with retired Minnesota Supreme Court Justice Alan Page to propose amending Minnesota's Constitution to make quality public education a fundamental right. This effort supports the Fed's mandate to achieve maximum employment with education being a key to obtaining a good job. Under Neil's leadership, the Minneapolis Fed also released an action plan on ending too big to fail, which calls for tighter bank regulations to avoid future taxpayer bailouts of large financial institution. Neil earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering from the U University of Illinois. He became an aerospace engineer, developing technology for NASA missions. Eventually turning to finance and public policy, he earned his MBA from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School, joined Goldman Sachs, and served in several senior positions at the U.S. Department of the Treasury including overseeing the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, during the last financial crisis. Before joining the federal, or pardon me, the Minneapolis Fed, he ran for governor of California in 2014 on a platform focused on economic opportunity. He lives with his wife, Christine, daughter, Uli, and Newfoundland dogs, Winslow, Webster, and Newsom in Orno, Minnesota. And now I'd like to welcome and turn things over to President Neil Kashkari. Thank you, Neil. Thank you very much uh, for the warm introduction and thank you and Michelle for having me and thanks to all the audience for inviting us. We really appreciate it. My colleague, Mark Wright, who's the Director of Research here at the Minneapolis Fed is on the call with me today and he'll join me in some of the Q&A. Let me just go through how I look at the, this crisis that we're in, the, the COVID crisis, and how we can respond to it and get through it and the outlook for the economy and then for North Dakota. I'll give some prepared remarks and then we'll turn it over uh, to Q&A. So obviously today you may have seen uh, another three plus million Americans file for unemployment insurance. Some 33 million Americans have lost their job in the last couple months. This is an unprecedented shutdown of the U.S. economy and devastating for millions of Americans who've lost their jobs. You know, we're we're all sheltering in place, so to speak, to try to slow the spread of the virus. So we're doing our part uh, to help the healthcare system but there are profound consequences for the American people who are being who are being put out of work and really struggling to make ends meet. The Fed's response in all of this, unlike the 2008 crisis, in the 2008 crisis, we were really the first responders in trying to stabilize the banking system. In this case, we're not the first responders. In this case, this is a healthcare crisis. It's like a natural disaster hitting the U.S. economy all at the same time. The first responders are the healthcare experts, the doctors and the nurses but also the scientists who are working hard to try to develop a therapy or a vaccine. They're the first responders. The second responders in a sense are all of us as we are sheltering in place, as we're social distancing to slow the spread of the virus. The third responders in my mind are really the fiscal actors, Congress, the executive branch, both in the federal government and at the states to try to provide support to small businesses, to workers, to help them get through this uh, healthcare crisis. And then comes in the Fed. Our role in all of this is to make sure that the financial system is working, that there's enough funding in the financial system so that 
when you go to your ATM, you can get money out, out of your ATM. Or if you're a business, you're able to get a loan to get liquidity to make ends meet and to keep operating. And so we're more in the background, but we are moving very, very aggressively to try to provide support to make sure our basic financial system is functioning. You know, uh, there are businesses in America today that are doing well. So people still need to eat. So many of the food producers, I know the ag sector is under pressure, but many of the, the food producers that you go to the grocery store and buy food, they're continuing to do good business because we're all going to the grocery store even more often needing, needing food to eat because we're not going to restaurants. But if those companies, those big companies couldn't tap into the capital markets because people were just afraid to buy bonds or to buy other investments, that's how this healthcare crisis could bleed over and spread into other sectors of the economy. So the Fed is acting very aggressively to make sure the financial system is working and that the financial plumbing is working so that the sectors of the economy that are not directly affected by this COVID crisis can continue to function. We need them to continue to function so that when we get back past the healthcare crisis, we can hopefully recover more quickly than if this were to turn into a full a full fledged financial crisis. So we're acting very, very aggressively. I think we learned our lesson from the 08 crisis. The Fed did bold things in 2008, but we're moving much more aggressively this time. And I think that's the right thing to do. And I think that we're seeing the benefits of that because the financial markets are starting to reopen to companies that are able to issue debt, for example, and continue to fund their operations. So as we look forward, you know, what's going to set the pace of this crisis? What's going to determine the pace of the recovery? It really is determined by the virus and how the virus progresses and how our healthcare system responds. We know that if there was a, an effective vaccine and we can inoculate all Americans, we could put this crisis behind us very quickly. Or if there was a therapy so that if you caught the disease, if you could get a treatment and get and recover quickly with no long-term health effects, that would also be a way of putting this crisis behind us. But th that doesn't exist today. And we're consulting with a lot of health experts who say an effective vaccine or an effective therapy could be a year or two or more away. You know, we, we have flu vaccines every year. They're only marginally effective. Uh, I think we would be hoping for this COVID vaccine to have something more effective than just a typical flu vaccine. So there needs to be, and hopefully there is, a massive effort across the country in the private sector supported by the government to pursue breakthroughs in vaccines and therapies to try to accelerate them as much as possible so that we can put this behind us as much as possible. And that's what we should be hoping for and working towards, but we should be planning that that's not gonna happen. We should be preparing for a longer, slower recovery. What we've looked at what's happening around the country with these massive job losses, you know, Congress designed the PPP program, the purchase or the payroll protection program that many North Dakota businesses participated in. That's meant to be a short term bridge for a couple months to help folks make payroll until we get through this. But as you look around the country, the social distancing is helping to flatten the curve, as you've heard. But unfortunately, the virus is still with us. A lot of Americans are still getting the virus. Tragically, a lot of Americans are still dying. And so that tells me this is likely going to be a longer ordeal, not just a short shutdown and a very quick recovery. Now, we know we can't shut down the economy for 18 months or two years until we have a vaccine. But we also know by looking around what's happened around the world, if you simply relax all of the social distancing and relax all the economic controls, there's a very high degree of likelihood that the virus would simply flare back up again and we would give back the gains that we have so the costly gains that we have achieved uh, with a lot of job losses and a lot of sacrifice. So on one hand, you can't simply just go back to normal because you could get overwhelmed by the virus. On the other hand, you can't simply lock down the economy for a couple of years. So my best consulting with healthcare experts, my best guess is that we are going to need to have very targeted reopening of the economy on not so much a geographic basis, but more a business by business basis. Some businesses naturally lend themselves to reopening safely. Now, I'll give you an example. I think about going to get my eyes checked for glasses or contacts at an optometrist's office. Every time I've gone to the eye doctor, it's never very crowded in there. So you could achieve social distancing and you could easily wear your mask and your optometrist could wear a mask. So that's an example of a business that seems like it lends itself to reopening in a safe manner. Contrast that with a movie theater. 
in a movie theater, theater you're surrounded by a hundred or a couple hundred other people in a densely packed auditorium. It's very hard for me to see how we could go back into movie theaters until we have a vaccine or a therapy. And so as we look ahead, unfortunately, what we've learned in the past month is this is likely going to be a slow recovery, not a, a V-shaped or quick return. And it's going to be on a targeted basis, business by business, as you determine which businesses can reopen safely. And then, of course, we need massive widespread testing so that we can see who has the disease, who's had the disease, and we can monitor if there are flare-ups. It may well be that if, as we start to reopen, if the virus flares back up again, we may have to reimpose social distancing to make sure that we can flatten it back out. You know, the, some people have said, well, why don't we just rush to what they call herd immunity, where 60 or 70 percent of the people get it? Well, you would end up having a lot of people uh, probably losing their life and probably needlessly, because if you overwhelm the hospitals and then heaven forbid you're in a car accident or you have a heart attack, but you go to the emergency room and you can't get treated because they're overwhelmed with COVID cases. So that's an example where you'd have many other needless deaths if the hospital system gets overwhelmed. So we are trying to balance reopening the economy to get people back to work and keep the economy moving, but also trying to achieve health and safety for the American people. And it's a there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, we don't know for certain yet. We've talked to the best health experts in the world. We don't know for certain yet that if you've had the disease and you recover, how much immunity that actually provides you and for how long that immunity lasts. We don't know yet. Uh, we don't know how many people have it today. We know that asymptomatic people, people who don't have the who don't have symptoms can spread the disease. One piece of good news is that it does seem like younger people, healthier people are at far less health risk than older people or those with what they call comorbidities, other pre-existing conditions. So you could also imagine a scenario where certain businesses start to reopen, leading with the younger workforce. And there may be Americans who have who are older or who have other health conditions that might need to just socially isolate for an extensive period of time until we get to a vaccine or a therapy. I know we'll talk about all of this more when we get to the Q&A. We conducted a recent survey across our district. The Minneapolis Feds district is Minnesota, the Dakotas, Montana, part of Michigan and part of Wisconsin. We had a very good participation from North Dakota businesses. Uh, about 60% of businesses that responded in our survey from North Dakota said that their revenues in April were down at least 25% over the prior year, and they expected May to be even lower. About 40% of respondents in North Dakota said that they had cut staffing compared to 2019 levels, and 35% expected further staffing cuts coming in May. Wages seem to be holding on. I mean, there have been some firms that have cut wages, uh, but most firms said that they have been able to hold their wages, at least for now. Uh, North Dakota firms seem to be on, you know, reasonably steady, steady financial footing with some cushion. About 14% of the respondents that responded to our survey in North Dakota said that only 14% said that they only had a couple months or so of cushion. Uh, the majority of firms said that they had more than a couple months of cushion, so that was uh, leading to some optimism. But that's the key question right now is we just don't know how long is this shutdown going to be? And again, if it's a business by business case, does it last for a few months? Does it last for six months? Does it last for nine months? The Paycheck Protection Program was designed to be a couple month bridge. It seems like looking at it now, we're going to need more than just a couple months uh, before we can really return to normal and go back to full economic activity. I also think looking at North Dakota, North Dakota was very effective. Uh, I think through these calls that you've been doing and working with your community banks to get the message out about the Paycheck Protection Program. So North Dakota has done very well in tapping into that program to support small businesses in North Dakota. That's great. But I also think North Dakota has its challenges with the huge uh, exposure to the energy sector. Obviously, the price of oil is getting really really hammered both with the geopolitical issues going on with Saudi Arabia and Russia, but also with the low demand for energy. That's really, I think, hitting North Dakota hard. And then obviously the large exposure to the ag sector. The ag sector continue, has been under pressure for years. And now this is just adding more pressure uh, with low commodity prices. So I think North Dakota businesses were probably pretty well positioned as well as anybody going into this, but then with, and are, are taking advantage and 
fully utilizing the government programs, which is great. It's what you should be doing. But I think the exposure to the energy sector and the ag sector presents challenges to North Dakota that are probably even greater than what other states are facing. So with that uh, quick overview, Michelle, why don't I turn it over to you and we can get in the Q&A. Wonderful, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for those remarks, Neil. And thank you to everyone who submitted questions for our discussion today. So let's get started. We are looking forward to looking forward. So first of all, Neil, we had many, many questions relating to our future. So combining several of those, I'm gonna ask a run-on question. What is your forecast for this region based on today's knowledge for the short, mid, and long term? And in answering that question, can you also share with us your thoughts on where's the bottom? When will we know that we're there? And you already spoke to this a little bit, but what does recovery look like? What is the length? Is it going to be one step forward and two steps back? What else can we expect? Well, there's a lot in that very good question. I'll say in the short run for our region, I mean, the, the short run for the economy nationally is, is bleak. Uh, 33 million Americans have lost their jobs. The unemployment, the official unemployment rate is going to come out tomorrow. will probably be around 16 or 17 percent. I think the real unemployment rate is probably going to be around 23 or 24 percent, which is just shocking. The reason there's a difference is because to be counted as unemployed, you have to answer a survey that you're actively looking for work. But so many people have been laid off and now we're sheltering in place. Many people are not actively looking for work because we've told them stay home. So I think that the real unemployment rate is probably gonna be around 23 or 24% just based on the job losses. So I think for this region and for the country, the short-term outlook is really bleak. The medium term, I mean, I'm hoping, well, we will, we will start to see some recovery this year, but it, the best case scenario would be a, a quick bounce back, but it's hard for me to see that until we get some type of technological breakthrough in a vaccine or a therapy. I don't wanna rule it out. We certainly have to try, but the health experts are cautioning us. That's not likely that we shouldn't plan for that. We should plan for a much more gradual recovery. You know, we study pandemics around the world to see what's happened, including the COVID crisis around the world. And we study past pandemics in America the worst pandemic in modern American history in the last hundred years is the flu pandemic of 1918. In that pandemic, it came in the spring. It was really hard in the spring. Things got better over the summer and people breathed a sigh of relief that, oh, we're through it. The worst is behind us. But then unfortunately it came back with a vengeance in the fall and the real devastation was in the fall. And so as we consult with ex health experts, they just don't know. They just don't know, is there a seasonality to it? Will it burn itself out slowly? Will it come back with a vengeance? And I wish I knew the answer to that. We just don't know. So I think the medium term is probably the most uncertain. Is it going to be a stronger recovery, a more gradual recovery, or will we have to return to a lockdown this fall? Unfortunately, we just don't know. Long term, I'm bullish. I mean, long term, uh, the U.S. economy is resilient. It's the most in innovative economy in the world. I think our region is uh, served well by diversity of sectors. Uh, there's a lot of innovation that's taken place in North Dakota over the past 10 years. And I know that we have a lot of contacts in the energy sector. I know they're facing extraordinary pressure right now, but they built their industry based on innovation. And we're not going to forget how to do all the smart things that they figured out how to do. And so long term, I'm absolutely bullish. We will get through this, but it may be a rocky a journey until we get to that recovery. Thank you so much. Well, related with countries around the world seeing their bond ratings dropping, do you expect that the United States will follow that same path? And if so, what would you suspect the timing to be? Uh, I don't suspect, I don't expect the US to follow that path. You know, our, our the chairman of the Federal Reserve had an expression at his uh, press conference last week where he talked about the great fiscal power of the United States of America. And I think he's exactly right. Uh, as challenging as our economy is right now, investors around the world still have more confidence in the US economy than anybody else's economy. And they would rather invest here than invest anywhere else. And so I think we, we are in a very strong position. We have the fiscal might to support our economy, to support our workers, to support our families until we get through this. We do know eventually uh, 
you know, we do need to pay back this debt that we're that we're taking on. Uh, we will need to pay this back, and we will be able to once we get through this crisis and get back to work. And ultimately, we're going to have to uh, tackle our long-run fiscal challenges, which are really driven by our programs like Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. A lot of those programs are funded by current workers paying for current retirees. And as our society is aging, those those ratios go into imbalance. And that's what drives up uh, those big fiscal challenges in the next 10, 20, 30 years. But maybe I could bring in my colleague, Mark Wright. He's an expert on, we call this sovereign debt around the world in some insights into how he looks at the US's sovereign debt position relative to other countries. Thank you, Neil. Uh, so I think Neil is absolutely right. If you look at uh, the data, the United States government is able to borrow at some of the lowest rates in its history. There's tremendous confidence that the US government is going to be able to repay, and so this does not seem to be a problem for us in the short or medium terms. Eventually, the US does have to come to terms with the fact that it's an aging population. We're not that far away from being at a point where half the US population is uh, 40 years old or older increasing numbers of people are retiring. Uh, and if nothing changes, we, there will need to be changes in the benefits that are paid to retired individuals through the social security system and through uh, the health insurance system. Uh, so these are longer term structural challenges that the US must face. But uh, for the short and medium term, uh, the US government is able to borrow very cheaply, a reflection of confidence in the US government's ability to repay. Uh, however, the question does touch on something important, which is that many countries around the world, particularly oil exporting countries, are in a great deal of difficulty, and uh, they may well be faced into repayment difficulties. And that's something we have to watch out for, because some of that debt is held by Americans, and some of it's held by US financial institutions. And so there is a danger that that could reflect back on the United States, and that's something we're monitoring very carefully. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, as you pointed out, Neil, there is so much that is unknown. And so with so many things outside of our control, what would you consider most within our control? Well, I think two things. One is that you know we all need to take action to continue taking action to make sure that we are safe and our families are safe and our employees and our colleagues are safe. And I think that's important to do that. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of people are anxious to get back to work and I absolutely understand it and I share those that sentiment, but we do need to realize that the virus is real and uh, you know, a lot of people unfortunately are still getting sick and tragically a lot of people are still dying. So that's number one. Number two, I would, my recommendation for businesses uh, on the call is to plan for a long journey. You know, I, I hope and I would love it if this is a quick rebound and in a few months there's a vaccine or there's a therapy and we can all put this behind us and think, why were we so worried? That'd be great. But I wouldn't plan on that. I would plan on, you know, we hear restaurants saying, well, I'm going to reopen with half as many tables so I can social distance. That sounds like a positive step. My question is, can they cover their costs if they have half as many uh, customers that they're serving? And so I, I would encourage businesses to think about if you need to have a long gradual recovery, how do you restructure your operating practices so that you can make this through? Because things like the Paycheck Protection Program are great. They're a short term bridge. It's a bridge for a couple months. But if we're really not back at full strength for a year or more, businesses need to prepare for that. And so that's what I would be encouraging businesses to be taking those, whatever action they can take now for that long-term journey. And if it turns out that a vaccine or a therapy comes sooner than we expected, that's great. We can celebrate then and then you can go back to your prior model at that point. But I would, as a general rule, rule hope and pray for the best, but prepare for the worst. Wonderful, thank you. And related, North Dakota is uniquely hardworking and determined, in my opinion. What is the most important thing that North Dakotans can do right now? I think it's some of the same things. I mean, I think that North Dakota has an advantage. We know, for example, that uh, it seems as though density is one of the drivers of, of spread of this disease, and it makes intuitive sense. If you're clustered in a subway car, you're more likely to breathe somebody else's air. Uh, so I think North Dakota has some advantages because uh, the population is more spread out around the state. So that's great. Uh, 
And so North Dakota, if you can, if we can get this behind us, North Dakota could be maybe part of the engine of getting us, getting the U.S. economy back on track. But a lot of it is out of our control, both on the healthcare side and obviously with the broader geopolitical issues around energy. And so I just think North Dakotans continue to be, to support one another, to take the crisis seriously, to position their businesses for a long-term recovery. I think all of that would be positive for North Dakota, but also for the country as a whole. Thank you. Well, as you mentioned earlier, North Dakota's primary industry is oil and agriculture, or like we, we like to say, oil and soil. So given the trajectory of the oil and ag markets, do you see opportunities for things we can be doing more innovatively to gain a competitive advantage or any other comments that you might be able to share with us relative to those two industries? Well, you know, it's um, just sticking with oil for a second. Well, both industries are incredibly innovative. You know, I always, uh, Silicon Valley gets a lot of attention for their breakthroughs like Twitter and Facebook and Uber. I actually think the most important technology breakthroughs of the last 10 or 15 years were in the oil sector. I mean, the, the, the very innovative people in North Dakota and Oklahoma and Texas effectively put a cap on the price of oil, on the price of energy, uh, through their their innovation and their hard work. And that's actually transformational if you think about just the global economy and not having these big spikes up to $100, $150 a barrel like we saw 10, 15 years ago. So I, you know, and you look at the last oil downturn, which was not as severe as this, you know, four or five years ago, that led to a lot of efficiency gains in the energy sector. So we reach out a lot at the Minneapolis Fed to energy companies because the oil sector is an important part of our district. And we've learned and I've toured the Bakken and I've followed the barrel of oil from uh, kind of the wellhead all the way to putting it on a freight car. You see how much innovation has taken place just in the last few years in becoming more efficient. So I would, although this energy price collapse is no doubt very challenging for oil companies and for workers, I also believe it'll continue to lead to more innovation in the energy sector in North Dakota to figure out how to become even more efficient, how to make wells profitable at even lower costs of oil. And so long run, I continue to be really bullish on the energy sector in the United States and in North Dakota. And I think that the innovatives, especially the small companies that have led this innovation, I think they're gonna continue to lead the innovation, but I'm not, uh, it's, I'm not, it's not lost on me how painful this current period is. Thank you. Early on, you mentioned the recent survey from the Federal Reserve that led to a report called Perspectives from Main Street, the impact of COVID-19 on communities and the entities that are serving them. And you shared some specific observations about North Dakota and our region. Are there any additional observations that uh, jumped out at you from that report that relate to North Dakota specifically? Well, I think the other observations were more similar as we look around the, the region. You know, one of the things that I'm very focused on is think about um, think about the banking sector as an example. So you have a coffee shop that's shut. That coffee shop has a rent payment due and the, co and the owner of the coffee shop calls up his landlord and says, I can't pay rent for the next few months until this is behind us. Well, that landlord has a mortgage on the building. And that landlord then calls up the bank and says, hey, I can't pay my mortgage for the next few months because the coffee shop, because my stores didn't pay me rent. So as this goes on, if this goes on for a long time, these losses tend to roll up into the banking sector. And so this is something that we're very closely paying attention to in North Dakota, around our district and around the country, because what we don't want to have happen is we don't want to have what is a health starting out as a healthcare crisis continues long enough and turns into some kind of a banking or financial crisis. And so we are looking at, I wrote an uh, editorial in the Financial Times a few weeks ago saying that big, large, very large banks should stop paying dividends and should raise more capital so that they can have a buffer against these kind of losses, which appear to be coming their way. So we, you know, the, the ripple effects of this crisis, it's immediately devastating to the restaurants and the movie theaters and the coffee shops but it's also having spillover effects into other sectors of the economy. And that's what we're trying to pay very close attention to. I think that's true in North Dakota, but I think it's true all across the country. 
Wonderful, thank you. So if you could give us some insight on how our region compares with other, well, let, let's start with North Dakota. How does North Dakota compare in your observation to other states in the 9th district? And then if you could take that to the next level and talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of differences in our district and other districts around us. Sure, I mean, I think North Dakota is different because of the industry concentration in both ag and energy. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if one of those sectors was booming right now? Uh, as an offset to the other. So I think it's, you know, it's a, in terms of that sector exposure, it's a little bit of a double whammy for North Dakota. On the positive side, I think North Dakota, again, it's more spaced out. I think it has a strong healthcare system. I think North Dakota is well positioned uh, to deal with the COVID crisis if we continue to follow, you know, the, the advice of experts. So I think North Dakota has some strengths, um, but also some challenges in the current environment. If we look at our region as a whole, our region as a whole really does look like the, the country because almost every major industry of the United States is represented in our region. Obviously, we have energy and ag in very large uh, representation. We have manufacturing, we have healthcare, we have services, we have technology, we have mining. This, what we call it the ninth Federal Reserve District, the Dakotas and Montana and Minnesota, and Michigan and Wisconsin. This is like a little snapshot of the United States of America. So many of the challenges that we're seeing across the country, we're also seeing here. If you look at, um, just think about some of the big companies in our region, think about General Mills, big food producer. You know, I, General Mills is doing a lot of business because we're all going to the grocery store because we're not eating out at restaurants, so we have to buy more food through the grocery stores. That's good for companies that supply that food to the grocery store. So there are, um, there are companies, I think, that are still doing well in this environment while there are others that are under challenge, you know, that are challenged. And obviously we also have excellent healthcare systems across our region that I think really benefits us that not everybody has. Wonderful. So if you could talk a little bit more about economic recovery and would you see it looking very different here rather than in the East or the West, for example? Well, the hope is that, again, the, the virus is what's going to determine the pace of the recovery. So, you know, we're not we're not yet seeing the intense flare ups that you saw in New York or you saw on the West Coast yet, though we are seeing pockets of flare ups, for example, in some of the meatpacking plants around our region. That's hitting very hard there where there are concentrations of a lot of workers in a small area. So, I mean, I'm hopeful that uh, and by the way, those concentrated areas, think about a meatpacking plant, it's somewhat easier for the healthcare experts to get their arms around that because it's it's concentrated. You could put a ring around it, so to speak. Uh, and it, if there is a vaccine, and when we talk to vaccine experts, they say part of the challenge is how do you ramp up to 300 million people? So let's say if we have the first million vaccines, you would focus those on hotspots or focus those on healthcare workers. So I think we have some advantages in our geography and in our the way the state is laid out that should lend itself to hopefully recovering more quickly or being able to tackle these hot spots when they flare up. So I think that that's an important difference and that will affect how we ultimately recover. But ultimately the recovery is gonna be determined by when all of us feel comfortable, when we feel safe to take our family, go back to a restaurant, uh, go back to a movie theater, go to a sporting event, uh, we need to feel comfortable and that's going to be when we have confidence that the healthcare system has really gotten this bottled up and I think we're a ways away from that right now. Thank you. I'm going to jump back to the surveys that are done by the Federal Reserve and encourage all of our participants today if you have not to please go and complete the survey. There was a link to it in your registration and there will be a link I believe sent out after this survey or after this session um, but Neil could you give us some insight as to how those results will be used and how important those surveys are yeah thank you for that question so our job you know I should have started with this and I apologize so the Minneapolis Fed is one of 12 Federal Reserve banks around the country we were created when the Federal Reserve system was created in 1913 by Congress and Congress wanted to make sure that all the different regions of the country had a direct voice in policymaking. So our job at the Minneapolis Fed is literally to represent all of you. It's to represent all of the people of the 
of this region and understand what's happening in our local economy and bring this back to Washington, D.C. So I go to Washington, D.C., or I used to go. Now we do it virtually every six weeks for at what we call FOMC meetings, Federal Open Market Committee, where we set interest rates for the region. And part of what I do in those meetings is I speak about what's happening on the ground in our economy here. I try to visit North Dakota at least once a year. Usually I've been going about twice a year. And we have regional economists who are out there regularly. And we conduct these surveys. And we have members of our board of directors. Uh, we have two of them, actually. Kathy Nezit, who is a terrific uh, oil industry expert. Uh, and then we have Brenda Foster, who's a banker, uh, sitting on our board of directors. And they also give us insight into what's happening in the North Dakota economy. So when you're when the folks on this call fill out these surveys, we read this information and it gives us a sense of what's happening on the ground in North Dakota. And then I literally take this with me to Washington, either physically or virtually. And then I speak about what's happening in the Dakotas, in North Dakota and South Dakota, when I give my advice for setting monetary policy for the nation. Now, we cannot set a different interest rate for North Dakota or for California or for Minnesota. We all use the same dollar. So it's one interest rate for this whole country. But we try to pick an interest rate that is optimal for the country as a whole. So the more you can give us, you, Michelle, but all of your listeners, the more insight you can give us into what's happening on the ground in North Dakota in terms of the business outlook, in terms of employment, in terms of wages, all of that will make us smarter so we can then, as a committee, make better decisions for the country as a whole. So if you have filled out the survey, thank you for doing that. If you get them in the future, please do fill them out. Uh, the, the information is put to good use. Thank you, and thank you for that encouragement. That is extremely important. Um, well, let's look again back to recovery and down the road. Does the Federal Reserve have any unique ideas or tools ready for another downturn? Should that come in six months or 12 months? What's the thinking today about the tools that may be needed down the road? Well, I will separate it out into uh, fiscal policy tools, which means Congress. So Congress is in charge of taxing us, how much they tax us, and then what they spend that on, whether it's education or defense or health care. And then separately is monetary policy, which is the Fed's domain, where we're putting out uh, money into the financial markets to make sure that the financial system is running and to make sure that we can stimulate economic activity. We, have, we call it, we have a dual mandate, which means we want to achieve stable prices, which is an economy that's not overheating, but also not slowing down. Uh, and we also want to achieve maximum employment, as many Americans as possible who want to work are able to find jobs. Obviously, we're not near maximum employment today. So how do we do that? Well, typically what we would do is we'd lower interest rates to try to boost economic activity to encourage Americans to go out and buy a house or to buy a car or to encourage businesses to go out and invest in a new factory by making it cheaper for them to get a loan. Well, we've already cut interest rates effectively to zero because of this crisis, but we have other tools that we could use if we need to to try to provide more of a boost to economic activity. So one of the things we did in the last crisis, we did something called quantitative easing, where we bought up long-term US government treasury bonds to try to drive down long-term rates, interest rates, to try to then in drive down long-term rates for businesses and for families. And that was effective in trying to provide a boost to economic activity. So that's another tool that we could use uh, going forward, buying up long-term treasury bonds to provide more stimulus. I mean, right now in this moment, we're not really trying to stimulate a ton of economic activity because we're all sheltering in place to try to slow down the virus. But once we begin to emerge from this, then we want to have as robust a recovery as we can. And I think the tools that the Fed has already deployed will support that robust recovery. And we have more tools available if we need to provide more of a boost to the economy once we get through this crisis. But the key right now is getting control of the virus. That's ultimately what's going to determine when we get to the recovery phase. Wonderful, thank you. Just a couple more questions. This next one is for both you and Mark. We've covered a lot of ground today. 
is there anything that we have not covered that you think is really important to discuss? Well, why don't I start, let me turn to Mark, see if Mark, anything on top of your mind that we haven't talked about yet? No, I think we've covered the most important thing. I mean, the single most important thing is what's happening to the virus, what's happening to public health, what's happening to our ability to treat the virus, treat the symptoms of it, and progress towards a vaccine. Um, and there, there's tremendous uncertainty, as Neil has, has explained. Uh, like Neil, I believe in hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst, and the worst is potentially another year or more of this. So I think that's the number one thing we're, we're talking about. Uh, the second is, of course, our response at the Fed to the economy and the slowdown, where we're trying to ease the effects of the slowdown. Uh, without necessarily stimulating the economy right now and getting ready to, as we open up, potentially provide stimulus there. The other things that are of a concern are what's happening internationally. Uh, we, that matters both from public health perspective as the virus is, begins to spread around the rest of the world. There'll be a reservoir of it that could always come back and reinfect the United States if and when we open up to more international travel again. And also what's happening to the financial systems around the world, because that has the ability to affect the US both by uh, reducing demand for US exports, but also potentially causing financial stability that may one day reflect back on the United States. So there are other things that we're worried about. Uh, there are a lot of things that keep me as the central banker economist awake at night. Um, but the, the main ones are what's happening with public health and what's happening with the economy per se. And we've already talked extensively about that. Thank you, Mark. And I would just add, Michelle, the one other thing that I would encourage, and you, you're probably already doing this, but you and your businesses, is really to share best practices on how to reopen safely. I mean, there's a lot of innovation going on. Businesses are trying different things. They're reorienting their business models. They're adopting different technologies. And I think no one knows exactly what the right answer is, because if you talk to the best health experts, you know, there's still uncertainty about how the virus spreads. Is it in the air? how effective are masks, et cetera. There's a lot of uncertainty. So I think the more that people can share what they're learning, what they're trying, what works, I think it'll be it'll help us all get through this as quickly as we can. Thank you, that's great advice. And uh, I agree with you. If you haven't been to our ndresponse.gov website, I would encourage you to check it out and share with others. We, over the last several weeks have done something that I hope we will look back on and be very proud of um, in collaborating with businesses that have been affected by the executive order that has either closed or reduced service to develop together safe protocols for reopening. And um, those can be found at ndresponse.gov. And we're really grateful at the Department of Commerce and to the chamber and to the business community in North Dakota for approaching this together. I think that's great advice. So on a personal note, you have a young daughter named Yuli. What will you tell her about this time in her life as she's too young to remember? And what lessons have you learned personally that you will pass on to her? Boy, that's a, <laughs> that's a great question. I'll tell you this. So our daughter is 15 months old. Um, we took her out of daycare about a month ago, even though the daycare is still operating because we're doing everything we can to socially distance. And I just figured, it, you know, we've got this one potential exposure with our daughter still in daycare. Uh, my wife uh, is one of the 33 million Americans who lost their jobs. Now we're very fortunate because I have a good job. We're gonna be just fine, but we're kind of in a, in a unique position. So now I'm, I've been working from home for the past two months as, in, as is almost our whole bank. And my wife is home and we took our daughter out of daycare. So what I would tell her is, as tough a time as this is for the country, and it's not pleasant for my wife to having lost her job, uh, and it's a shock for all of us, it's actually a wonderful time for us to spend with our 15-month-old daughter and to get to be there with her all day. And so even though I'm, I'm in the basement working most of the day, I can still come up at lunch and play with her before she takes a nap. And so it's actually, it's a very sweet, precious time for us as a family, even though it's a very, very difficult time uh, for the country as an economy and in the healthcare system. So I'll tell my daughter about how much we cherish the time we got to spend with her uh, during this crisis. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Well, Neil and Mark, one of the benefits of this format with muted participant lines 
is of course the lack of, of distraction and the clarity in the transmission, but also if you tell a corny joke, you can imagine people are laughing and you will never know differently. So I'm going to demonstrate that now. It occurred to me as Eric was reading your introduction um, that with your degrees and your experience at NASA, that you know the saying that is rocket science or that's not rocket science that you are actually a rocket scientist and i am very grateful that you're in the position you're in leading us through these complicated times so a little bit of corny humor but very sincere with our gratitude i want to thank you for the time that you've taken today to visit with us our shared experience in North Dakota as across the nation and even the globe over the past six weeks has caused us to be very deeply immersed in the moment. And I wanna thank you for the chance to look up and ahead. And I wanna let everyone know on the call today that you can follow both the Federal Reserve Bank and Neil on Twitter at Federal Reserve and at Neil Kashkari. And thanks again so much. I'd like to turn it back over to my colleague, Eric Spencer. Thank you, Michelle. On behalf of everyone tuning in and North Dakota businesses across the state, I'd sincerely like to thank uh, Neil Kashkari, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis, Mark Wright, Senior Vice President and Research Director at the Minneapolis Fed, and last but not least, North Dakota Commerce Commissioner Michelle Comer for taking the time to join us today and for Michelle and the Department of Commerce to be our partners in crime over the last eight weeks. As Neil mentioned, and Michelle as well, the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis has been partnering with state chambers and the Greater North Dakota Chamber to survey businesses on the impacts of COVID-19. This morning, you all received a link to that survey uh, along with the login information to this webinar. Uh, please go take five minutes and fill that out. That information is critical to informing future monetary policy. If you'd like to learn more about the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, please go to minneapolisfed.org. A recording of this business briefing will be available at ND Responses, or pardon me, ndresponse.gov's COVID-19 page in the Business and Employer section. It'll also be available at ndchamber.com, and at both websites, you can find all previous business briefing recordings and su supporting material. You can also go to ndresponse.gov for a variety of business resources, including details on the North Dakota Smart Restart and frequently asked questions on many other topics. If you have COVID-19 business related questions and aren't sure where to go, you can send them to businesshelpcovid19 at nd.gov. Finally, on behalf of the Greater North Dakota Chamber and the North Dakota Department of Commerce, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and over the past eight weeks. Please stay safe, be North Dakota smart, and stay engaged as we work to get through this together. Thank you. Thank you for joining the special business briefing. The live event is now complete.